Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, I am Bill Gray, Communications Director for the R Street Institute, a uh, free market think tank here in DC. Um, today, I'm here representing the organizers of this event, the Article One Coalition, uh, whose mission is to help modernize and further empower the legislative branch of our federal government. And that is why today we're fortunate to bring you uh, an event focusing on the US Capitol Police. Um, it's a conversation that's extremely timely, uh, unfortunately, because of the violent tragedy that happened last week but it does provide me a unique opportunity to introduce you to the three individuals who will be joining the event. Our moderator, Chris Marquette, is a reporter for Roll Call. Uh, among other issues he covers, if you follow his byline, Chris is the only reporter with a dedicated beat covering the US Capitol Police. Uh, the first of our two panelists, Daniel Schumann, is policy director for Demand Progress. His organization is the only nonprofit that has consistently dedicated resources to understanding how the US Capitol Police operate. And finally, and last but not least, is Nicole Tisdale, a former congressional staffer who worked on the House Committee on Homeland Security. She brings a wealth of knowledge about the intersection between national security and Congress, and has also recently published a book, which you can see just over her shoulder, called A Right to Petition, A Practical Guide to Creating Change in Government. If you've read any of the news stories over the past week, you've probably recognized Chris's byline, and you probably saw Daniel and Nicole quoted. Um, but with that brief introduction, and thank you again for joining us, I will kick it off to Chris. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I, I, I want to start with Daniel first and then Nicole second, um, kind of a, you know, a primer on, on what the United States Capitol Police does, what its jurisdiction is, and you know, what, what their basic function is. Uh, Daniel, want to start us off? Yeah, so thank you for the question, and, and I'm pleased to be here speaking with you, although under such unpleasant circumstances. So the Capitol Police Force is the security force that's dedicated to protecting the Capitol complex and almost all of the legislative branch agencies. It has approximately 2,450 employees and slightly in just around 2,000 officers. Um, you know, it, it plays a hybrid role and its role has changed over time. Its first and foremost duty is to, keep, is to protect the Capitol complex and keep it open for the work of government. Uh, so that people can go and talk to their members of Congress and engage in the political process. It has an additional role that's grown over time of protecting the area around the, um, uh, the Capitol itself. Uh, there were a number of incidents in the 90s uh, where the area around uh, the, the Congress was not that safe. Uh, so they started playing a policing role and that policing role has expanded significantly where we see the vast majority of the arrests that they report have to do with things like traffic stops and people in Union Station and, and sort of that kind of stuff. And it's not the types of things that you would expect, although there's a fair amount of things like addressing demonstrators. Uh, for what's publicly reported with respect to their arrest, that seems like a, a diminishing part of their work. Uh, the final thing that's sort of worth noting is that the Capitol Police Force has grown tremendously uh, from 2000 to 2020. Uh, we've seen a tripling in their budget uh, from around 150-ish million dollars a year adjusted for inflation to around 500 million dollars a year, and the number of people on the police force has has grown significantly as well. Uh, so uh, the Capitol Police are much larger, uh, well-funded, um, and largely unaccountable uh, in terms of the work that they do. So hopefully that's a useful uh, starting point. And Nicole, you've been, you know, you're a, you're a, Hill, a veteran of the Hill who, you know, knows a lot about the Capitol Police. Uh, can you kind of, you know, tell us about, you know, your experience working on the Hill, uh, what the role of the Capitol Police was um, in your eyes as a, as a staffer when you were, when you were working there on the Hill? Yeah, um, and I share um, in Daniel's comments about the timeliness of having this event and how happy I am to be a part of this conversation, but just to know that we're continuing to have these conversations. So for 10 years, working on the counterterrorism and intelligence issues on Capitol Hill, it was always an interesting dichotomy because most of the policy work that we were doing was always outward facing. So when we are talking about um, most of the, the counterterrorism policies that we are putting in place, people aren't necessarily thinking that these policies are going to impact the Capitol Police. But one of the things that I've, I've shared is while the work that we do was focused and a lot of it went through the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security has oversight over it in, in most cases is that first point of contact on counterterrorism issues with state and local law enforcement. And that does include Capitol Police. And so what we always kind of use capital or how we thought about capital police as a model is while we were doing that legislation is 
you really think about some of the best practices that you would want um, where you work. Um, and so I think what happened for us last, last week, as we're looking at all of this, you not only see structurally the, what happened on that day, you start to see that we had been, or we had been told that there have been preparations for all of this since 9-11. And so to see the failure and see it at such a, a level, it not only makes you think, well, what is going on with Capitol Police? It's also like, is this something that could happen with other state and local law enforcement? And we definitely see that with all the intel reporting that's coming out about the state capitals, um, because from the outside looking in, it just looked like all the training, all the money, all the grants, everything that has gone into place was so we would be prepared if something like this happened. And it just, it all fell apart. So it, it looks, you think about the training of how to handle active shooters, how to handle um, mass gatherings, all these things that the Department of Homeland Security and, and the FBI has put a, a lot of resources and a lot of training in. And you're watching it, I was watching it live on TV and you're just like at every step, at every turn, it seems like there was a training for this. Capitol Police participated in it. Why didn't, why didn't the training actually turn into execution. And I think you both made good points. Uh, one of the things that that I thought was notable is that, you know, they, they, they are robustly funded. They are a robustly funded department. And, you know, you, you expect them to be ready for, for things of this nature. I mean, their, their mission is to protect and secure Congress and, and, and leadership, um, you know, failed in, 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 on, on, on January 6th. Uh, so that that leads me to my next question, which is, you know, when 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 we were hearing a lot about, you know, these 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 notions that um, there was going to be a large uh, presence of 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 pro Trump um, people who who were going to be there and going to be there to contest the certification of the electoral college results, and. You know, in preparation for that, roll call reached out, a CQ roll call reached out to uh, the Capitol Police to, to say, hey, you know, what, what precautions, what preparations have you made to, uh, to make sure that you're ready for, for January 6th? And Eva Malecki, the press, uh, the press contact over at Capitol Police, you know, said, you know, they're not going to discuss the, the, the specifics, but they said, rest assured, we have a comprehensive plan in place to protect uh, to pr protect members, staff, and the, and the, and the Capitol on January 6th. And obviously that didn't happen. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk nowadays, uh, you know, it's, the Capitol Police has been thrust into the forefront about the lack of transparency in the department. Uh, as part of the leg legislative branch, they're not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. They do not need to produce documents that they don't feel like they want to produce. And, um, you know, their inspector general reports are, 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 not, are not available to the public. Um, and, you know, Daniel, I know uh, Demand Progress has covered this extensively. Uh, you know, can you, can you talk about the issues uh, with, uh, with transparency and the department and, and what you think uh, could be improved? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, so I, I think a starting point is I look at the Capitol Police and to the extent that they take on regular policing functions, they should be held accountable in the way that other municipal the police departments would be held accountable. If they were a city or municipality police department, they'd be the 11th or 12th largest in the United States. And you would have a civilian oversight board. You'd have an independent inspector general who can release reports to the public. You would have a FOIA process where um, one, it would exist. And not only would it exist, but you'd have a method of vindicating it through the courts if they refused to give you that information. They would routinely post information about their activities. They would have a lively oversight process that would happen and play out largely in public and their oversight entities would have the stakeholders in place. Now it's a little bit different because it's inside the legislative branch and it's a little bit different because they have the security function, although many large police departments like the New York Police Department have their own security function as well. Uh, but even in that place, like if you think about just the stakeholders in the capital complex, right? It's the members, but it's the staff who have different interests than the members. It's the police officers who have different interests as well. Like the, the union is a very different entity than the leadership over there. It's the press and the press gallery that need to be represented. I mean, there were stories of, of uh, police officers at one point putting their hands on the press uh, a year and a half ago. There's lobbyists and then there's the general public. 
And those entities are not reflected uh, in any type of oversight. Instead, what you have is the House Sergeant at Arms, the Senate Sergeant at Arms, and the Architect of the Capitol, which are all political entities reporting directly to leadership. So their incentives are not aligned with uh, a lot of the transparency and accountability that can address the problems. The, the way that most of, of dealing with the Capitol Police has been is let's throw money at them, right? And, and that's what Congress has done. Every time they think there's a thing, we're gonna throw more and more money at them. Uh, but at least from what we can see from a public perspective and from those inside who will talk to us, the internal accountability, it, like it, the, it doesn't happen in the same kind of way. Uh, and you can see the results that there wasn't a test, right? There wasn't someone who was red teaming this. There wasn't someone who was pushing back. There wasn't someone that was uh, uh, dealing with um, sort of the some of the structural problems. And like when you look at ledge branch approaches, right? Um, we actually had really good leadership with Tim Ryan uh, on this. Like he was pushing for lang legislative language that he ultimately got a week before the incident. Um, but people who are on ledge branch, their staff turns over rapidly, the members turn over rapidly. There's not a great incentive to stay on that committee. House admin has been very good here, but generally speaking, House admin and Senate rules similarly are disinclined to do the, the oversight work that they've done here. It's a it's a real tribute to Zoe Lofgren and Rodney Davis that they've been willing to do what they did, including the hearing in 2019. Um, sorry, I, I think this, oh, this is a long-winded answer, but the, but the final thing is that with police, you have to have a culture of accountability. You have to have a culture of responsiveness. And you had mentioned uh, the communications director over at the Capitol Police. This person in that office seems to be focused about denying access to information, not about answering questions. Uh, last year, we sent in a request once a week for six or eight or 10 weeks, I forget now, to meet with the chief, chief of police. We didn't get a response, didn't get a response, and finally we got a fairly ominous response. And when we try to talk to the communications director, we rarely get a response, and if we get a response, it is the opposite of helpful. There is a mentality problem over at the Capitol Police with the way they address the congressionals, the staff, the public, the journalists, and others. And that needs to change. That's a problem that comes from the top. And it's been there for a very long time. And it's something that needs to change. And uh, one thing uh, you know, I want to mention uh, with the points that all uh, good points you made, Daniel, is you know, I've covered police departments in rural Mississippi, uh, suburban Connecticut, and the Capitol Police. And you know, in, in those previous local police departments, they've, you know, the, the, the top, the leadership has always been willing uh, to meet with reporters and, 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 and talk about, you know, issues, you know, a sit down with the chief just to get to know each other, everything like that. Um, you know, Chief Sund, I started covering the department uh, when Chief Sund uh, actually uh, rose to the rank of, of chief. And uh, I tried to, you know, tried to sit down and meet with him, never got a chance to. Um, and the only time I would see him at um, would be at, you know, hearings, ledge branch of probes hearings, house admin committee hearings, and a gender discrimination uh, uh, federal case. Um, you know, he was he was present for that uh, to to support the the department in that in that case. Um, but uh, question for uh, Nicole: uh, Do you think you know, with your background in counterterrorism intelligence? Um, in the House of Representatives, do you think what happened on January 6th could have been prevented? That's a good question. And I mean, it comes up in the counterterrorism space all the time, but I think it, it goes to one of the things to remember about how we handle counterterrorism. Uh, there are gonna always be bad actors is how, we is how we mitigate and how we respond. And so I would say, could it have been prevented? I'm, I'm unsure, but I know there are just some basic tenets that we could have put in place so that even if there is intelligence that something like this is going to happen, we are we are more prepared for it. There are all kinds of, of models that exist um, outside of the Capitol Police, unfortunately, um, that could have been helpful in this space. So one of the things that we talk about, you know, next week we have the inauguration coming. The inauguration has been designated an, a national security special or a national special security event, an NSSE. What happens once you get that designation? Um, it, it's, it's very seamless. People don't always know that it's happening, but we've decided that if your city is hosting the Super Bowl, that your, your police department may be really good, but you need a different level of counterintelligence. You need a different level of law enforcement presence 
And we've decided that we will come in as a federal government and the Department of Homeland Security through Secret Service, through FEMA, but also FBI, they all have different roles that they play. And so the idea that we were, we're, we're now learning that there was all kind of intelligence that what happened on Wednesday could happen. And our response was, but we're gonna treat that like it's just any normal protest. And I think this, this, uh, this culture that we've seen play out with the Capitol Police last Wednesday is, they have protests all the time. And so every time they are making a decision about how they're going to handle the protesters, and as it seems, depending on the topic, they're gonna to handle the protesters in a very different way. You can't have, like, we've decided that we can't do that when you're hosting the Super Bowl. We can't allow the police departments to have that kind of control and get to make those calls when you're hosting the World Series or the Boston Marathon. And so even that model is something that could have been in place, but to, to, to Daniel's point, but also the point that you're making, when you close off a police department the way that they have been closed off, there's no sharing of information. Like there is no, uh, we're still learning what the FBI, what information the FBI had versus what the Capitol Police had. So even as we talk about some of the culture, you know, the, Congress is the kind of place, and I've been talking to staffers a lot this week, Congress is a workplace where people get death threats all the time and they never report the death threats. But I think that also speaks to the culture of the Capitol Police. Like we don't know what they would do with the death threats either. Like there is no intelligence reporting. We don't know. Now we can see people are sharing stories where it's like, well, actually we've had white nationalists calling our office for the last four years making death threats. Well, I understand why a lot of these offices haven't been reporting it because it's not like Capitol Police is releasing a report every year so that you can see that the threat has actually gone up. We're get the Capitol Hill offices are getting more than they are getting more threats than they have. And oh yeah, you're getting more threats from white supremacists than you are from sovereign citizens. When we don't have any kind of accounting or any reporting, you can't even change the culture of how the staff and how the members interact with the Capitol Police because you don't even know that you're supposed to be reporting this. You think it's just the nature of the job that people are doing death threats. And you also don't know how prevalent it is within the Capitol ecosystem. Yeah, that's a really important point. I mean, the information sharing is 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 a is a real, real um, you know, disservice to the public because this is, you know, this is an important federal police department that that is you know, accountable to the public ultimately, and for the public to not get that kind of information is, is, um, is, is, is not, is, is, it's unfortunate. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, like the number of threats, like, you know, there's, there's limited amount of information about that. Chief Sund uh, mentioned at a House admin committee oversight hearing of the Capitol Police back in uh, 2019 that threats you know, to members were going up. They're the highest that they ever were. And then uh, subsequently in the Ledge Branch Appropriations Bill for, for 2021, um, the Senate version uh, mentioned that uh, they were increasing funding for the Capitol Police up to $515 million uh, because of, uh, you know, a continuation of increased threats. But, you know, follow-up questions about that are not answered and it's tough to try to get an understanding of, you know, what's going on, like what kind of resources are by, by the Capitol Police are being deployed to the localities in which the members have, you know, in their districts, like what kind of operations are going on over there to ensure the safety there? How are they spending the money there? You know, all those questions are unanswered. And, uh, you know, a question, uh, you know, I want to ask you, Daniel, uh, there were a number of accountability measures that were proposed in the Ledge Branch Appropriations Bill in the House that actually, you know, moved through the House uh, last summer. Um, what happened to those? So uh, a week before the event, uh, since their committee report language, they didn't become law, but they they were directive. They were operative. They've come into effect where the police are supposed to put them in place. Um, I should. I, make, I should make it a point to, to praise the Legislative Branch Appropriations Committee in the House, the subcommittee, because they really listened to us and to others who were advocating for a number of these reforms. So there is the request for the Capitol Police to implement a FOIA-like process. Now, it's not required of them. We have no idea what regulations they will put into effect. And since it's uh, the way they would do in the ledge, for instance, there's no vindication through a court process, but that's something. 
uh, there is a direction to go and look at the IG reports and figure out whether there are some of those IG reports that could be made publicly available. Now, what it should be is that all the IG reports should be publicly available unless they can articulate a specific reason why not, and they should just release a summary. But from where we are to where they're going, like this is a significant change. There uh, uh, are studies or, or reporting back requested on things like diversity within the police department. There is real reason to think that um, the leadership is much more of a monoculture than the rank and file, that there is ongoing discrimination problems that exist within the police department and have existed for a very long time uh, and are not resolved despite litigation because the standard for winning a lawsuit on employment discrimination means that it can still persist um, and the police department can win even though they don't solve the underlying problems. Uh, there are other measures having to do with um, uh, sort of other aspects of diversity. I, I don't remember all the details off the top of my head at the moment. There was a big fight on that um, where the House had stronger language and the Senate was trying to claw it back. And uh, we lobbied the Senate hard sort of in secret on this to try to prevent some of that information from being taken out. And it looks like we ultimately prevailed, but it was a very close fought fight on looking at sort of some of the demographic questions. Um, and we do hear sort of, oh, and the final thing, and it's not in the, the report, but this is something that is an ongoing problem, um, is that there hasn't been a union contract in 10 years uh, between the Capitol Police, which is a unionized, uh, has the Fraternal Order Police representing them, and the management. And their contract was put, I don't know the right term, I would say in abeyance, it's suspended in some fashion as a consequence of COVID. Uh, so as a consequence, many of the protections that had been negotiated and were sort of being continued on, at least in sort of an interim basis, a lot of that stuff went away as well. So, you, so there was significant negative consequences uh, for a number of the members. And I, I do just want to sort of add a coda there, which is to really just to, to uh, add to what Nicole was saying, which you know was spot on and I agree with all of it. Um, I remember sitting in the Longworth building back when it was possible to sit in the Longworth building maybe two years ago and talking with um, staff who are responsible for looking at the police. And we were discussing the likelihood of a terrible incident happening. And the three of us who were sitting there all could see the signs, right? It was obvious from the nature of the Trump administration, the way that things were being radicalized that sooner or later something was going to happen. We didn't know what it was. We speculated on it a little bit, but like the warning signs were all there. Uh, this was, while well, what happened on the 6th, we couldn't have predicted that specifically, although I was really nervous about it that week. Um, it was clear that something was coming. Like, you can see how there was an increase in all of the indicia of danger. And the fact that we weren't ready for it, um, despite the heroism of individual members of the Capitol Police, despite the heroism of the D.C. The police department and others who showed up, um, this was anticipated. My, Nicole has heard this before. My first day on the Hill was 9-11, right? I was there, like I had an interview that day uh, in the Hart Building. And then I came back, I got the, the position as an intern. And then I ended up being subject to the anthrax attack. You know, the fact that the Capitol complex deals with persistent threats is not a surprise to anyone. And when you make the folks who are responsible for protecting it insular and unaccountable to the politicals, uh, to the public, to the other people who need to go into the complex. What you do is you set up a circumstance where failure is inevitable. And I think that is what happened, is that the rank and file were left out to dry, uh, that there were significant problems in the way that recruitment and training happened, that management wasn't ready for it, and that when push came to shove, uh, I mean, we can see the terrible results. And if we don't change the underlying systems, right? Getting rid of the top is certainly the right thing to do, but if we don't change the systems that reinforce um, these circumstances, it's going to happen again. And, and we have to get ready. Yeah, and um, ultimately what, what Daniel was talking about uh, was you know, the, the, the accountability measures in the House version ultimately got watered down in a, in a substantial way, ultimately the final uh, fiscal year 2021 uh, you know, appropriations bill had a small 
little paragraph in it about information sharing from the Capitol Police. It, you know, basically encouraged them to share more information with the public, but, you know, whether or not it's a requirement, you know, it's not a requirement. Um, and, you know, I asked Tim Ryan, the chairman of the Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee this, um, you know, this week, uh, he said there's, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a strong appetite in Congress now to, you know, more vigorously pursue these reforms uh, after what happened. So, you know, we can expect to see, um, you know, there's at least a little bit more momentum uh, for this that wasn't there before. Um, so that, that's one thing. And then a question uh, from our audience that I thought was, uh, you know, particularly uh, good uh, for Nicole. Do other federal law enforcement and security agencies publish any sort of summary statistics on threat trends, either for congressional use or public access? And is this a model the Capitol Police could adopt? Nicole. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and the answer is yes. So um, I have to give a little bit of uh, background just in case people aren't familiar. So at the federal level, the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, is responsible for coordinating and integrating um, both domestic and foreign terrorist information. So they are, think about them as the middleman for where the intelligence community also sits at the same table with everyone that's a part of the law enforcement community. I would say um, just based off background, I think Capitol Police actually does do a very good job in sharing information about foreign terrorist organizations and foreign terrorist threats that they receive. They sit at those tables, they share their information. As Daniel said, um, the, the Capitol complex or just the congressional ecosystem is always under constant attack. And so I would say they do a really good job about sharing foreign terrorism information. The problem is when we start talking about domestic terrorist threats, that is not only an issue that the Capitol Police face or sharing the information, it's also just seen spread throughout the federal government, but also at the state and local level as well. Um, I, one of the things that we learned after the Charleston church shooting in 2015, we, it was clear to us that like there, there is a move, the, the white nationalists have always been here, but there is clearly a movement that is happening. We were also very concerned about sovereign citizens. Um, after you saw what happened in Nevada um, on, on the public land. So when we start pulling, because you know most of this data, NCTC is coordinating a lot of it, but they're not necessarily collecting all of it. Their job is to put it all together. So you have FBI collected information, you have DHS collected information, but then you also have the agencies and the intelligence community. There is public reporting of our foreign terrorist threats. There, up until 2005, we used to have public reporting of our domestic terrorist threats and, um, you know, how government works. Like someone at FBI decided in 2005 that we didn't need to release that report to the public anymore. And so in fast forward 10 years later, in 2015, we, we feel, we hear that these threats are growing, but there is no public reporting. There's actually, at that point, you had to like your congressional committee, we could request the information from FBI and, and you know, somebody in a basement somewhere would like pull it together and, and send it in an email. And so we started asking questions and it's like, oh, well, you know, the resources, but also there's this reluctance because we got so much pushback from FBI over the years that said, well, we don't wanna get into a place where we're infringing on people's first amendment rights. So we don't wanna actually say how many investigations we have in terms of domestic terrorist movements, not groups. Um, and so our pushback to that was, you know, former FBI Director Comey has no problem coming to Capitol Hill and telling us that there's an open investigation in every state on ISIS operatives within that state. They have no problem really sometimes inciting fear in the American public when it comes to foreign terrorist organizations which a lot of, of uh, the ones they would highlight were jihadist groups. But when we start talking about domestic terrorism, everybody shuts down and, and everybody all of a sudden is like, well, First Amendment. And it's like, no, we can talk about movements, but the, the point about the data is if you don't have that information, then you don't even, we're at a disadvantage because we don't know who they're investigating. We don't know what congressional districts have a higher number of domestic terrorist movements and investigations and assessments going on comparatively to where, where there are sovereign citizens. Um, and this whole idea that once, it, once something happens, 
then the FBI, like, you know, we're hearing this, that the FBI had a lot of people under investigation who were a part of the riots. Well, if only we had known that those people, we don't have to know that those people, if we had known that those movements were, and we were getting intel assessments that they are radicalizing on the internet, just like ISIS radicalized on the internet, and they're getting better at it, and they're doing it. You have to have this continuous flow of information so that the officers understand this is not something that is happening in your bubble. This is something that is much bigger than you, and it is happening all throughout the United States. I will highlight that the 2019 NDAA um, staff snuck in the language to require FBI to start back reporting, publicly reporting, um, and they can do a classified annex if they need to for more detail, but to start publicly reporting on domestic terrorist numbers again. Um, probably not a shock to anybody on the call. The report was due in 2020 and it hasn't made it to the Hill yet. But that is one of those things where it's like, we have got to, you, can, you can't keep treating domestic terrorism like it's a one-off. Um, and you, right now, all of the incentives with the Capitol Police are not tied to them even acknowledging that there are domestic terrorist threats. It, for, for most of their work, they're only focused on foreign threats. And this, you know, this came from within. And Nicole, to your point about domestic terrorist threats, uh, do you think there's a racial component to that? Um, you know, I mean, several lawmakers, including, uh, you know, Congresswoman Ayanna Pressley, a Massachusetts Democrat, um, and others have said race is absolutely a factor in the way that the largely white mob of pro-Trump rioters was treated on January 6th. Can you, um, can you kind of expand on that? I can, and I, I agree with Congresswoman Presley, 100% on this. And, and we've talked about it. It is, you know, when we see someone that is, is bringing Confederate flags with them to these rides, to this protest, when there is a noose on the National Mall, anyone that wants to have a conversation with me and say, this isn't about race, this is about an attack on our democracy, I'm like, no, no. Th they are very, these are white nationalists and they are grounded in racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, all, anything that you can think of that is not white is right and white is, is best. And I think we all do ourselves a disservice when we try to figure out if this is really, every, everything that they have said that even if we could trace the dots back to democracy, when they say election fraud or voter fraud, what they're saying is too many minorities voted. It's, it, it's no way that all these minorities legally voted. Um, and I think it's also important to, to say, and I've seen a, a couple of members acknowledge this point too, you know, Congress is also the most representative in terms of minority representation of our three branches of government. So it is also, it is the, it is the place that is becoming more and more diverse. And so to, to bring this, this, this white nationalist, this hate, literally walk it from the White House to the legislative branch, there's that visual is very powerful because that for them is the branch that the minority is growing in a way where they need to not only silence it, but they want to show up armed and show that like we will attack it. And I think that's very important. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people are trying to have this conversation in, in all of these, maybe what they think are PC ways, but we really do ourselves a disservice when we don't acknowledge what the foundation of this attack was. And uh, Daniel, um, lawmakers are calling for a full review of the Capitol Police, you know, the way in which it reports to the Capitol Police Board. Can you, can you talk a little bit about uh, the structure of the Capitol Police and the hierarchy and uh, how it um, reports to the Capitol Police Board and, and who, who it's accountable to? Sure, I'll, I'll talk about it to the extent that I understand it. I have, there are significant gaps in my understanding, largely because it's very hard, at least for me, to figure out what's going on. If I can just take just one moment, I just want to say that what Nicole said, I think, is absolutely right. Uh, when you look at even debates, you know, as large as like so-called states' rights, which is really not about states' rights, or even debates about Confederate statues in the Capitol, right? This is about sending messages um, uh, overt or covert to um, uh, white nationalists and those who are afraid that that uh, power is going to be moved away from them to somebody else. And that's, you know, 
uh, slavery in America was talked about America's original sin, but it was really about, you know, which is right. And it is often about the belief that you can, you know, some people are inferior to others and we're going to divide and conquer and control based upon that type of behavior. And that is something that persists, uh, including with the, the big lie about voting fraud, right? You know, uh, which is not true, but, you know, you see it echoed by even people who are reasonable on other topics. Uh, because the, the window of how we discuss these things, that in-person voter uh, fraud is not a thing. It's not a thing. Like, it doesn't happen. What does happen is disenfranchising people from their ability to vote by the way that we lawfully go and change who can go to the polls and um, the way that we go and we police some folks but not other, you know, like, this is all of a piece, uh, which is why it's bringing up such passion. Uh, but to actually answer your question, Chris, sorry about that uh, uh, diversion for a second. Uh, so the Capitol Police is overseen by the Capitol Police Board. The Capitol Police Board is composed of three entities. It's the House Sergeant at Arms, the Senate Sergeant at Arms, and the Architect of the Capitol. Uh, and then the Capitol Police Chief also sits on the Oversight Board for the, sorry, the Capitol Police Board as an ex officio member. As you know, the House Sergeant at Arms is uh, chosen essentially by the Speaker of the House. The Senate Sergeant at Arms is chosen essentially by the Senate Majority Leader. And the Architect of the Capitol is chosen through a convoluted process. Uh, if I remember right, I think there's like a no Congress picks a bunch of names out of the hat. Uh, they, they take the top three names, they send those top three names to the President and then the President um, uh, picks the one person who will head the, arch who will head the, the Architect of the Capitol. And the architect of the capital is intended as kind of a tiebreaker, um, but that person doesn't really have any expertise on policing, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So he or she will often defer to the politicals. And I should just point out that uh, the police chief who sits on the Capitol Police Board uh, is a non-voting member of the board. Um, so like I said, it's an ex officio position only. And uh, what, what you really have is like, it's a direct pipeline between the police chief and then the political arms, the sergeant at arms, that are the arms of leadership in of, of, of the leaders of either chamber. And that is the, the major uh, oversight mechanism. There are also, as you know, like the ledge branch appropriations is in charge of money, house rule, um, sorry, house admin and senate rules are responsible for oversight. Um, but except for the recent hearings that Committee and House Administration did, Oversight by the overseers is, at least from a public perspective, doesn't really happen that much. And ledge branch, it really depends on who's in charge uh, and how much they're willing to push. And there is a real reverence that members have for the Capitol Police. And there's a lot of debate in our country focused around um, uh, deference to police, you know, the Blue Lives Matter stuff. Um, uh, uh, has a real influence on the way that legislators are willing to deal with a lot of these questions, and it implicates the level of oversight that actually takes place. So those are the, the oh, and I should, sorry, sorry, Chris, and there's also the Capitol Police Inspector General, um, but we don't really have any insight into what they do because we can't see what happens there. Yeah, um, and Democratic members of Congress, some have said uh, that they saw Republican members of Congress giving tours to uh, people who might have been involved in, in, in the January 6th riots um, on the day before. Um, there have been uh, questions raised by lawmakers uh, about, um, you know, what, whether or not, you know, what kind of role uh, members of Congress had in this. Uh, as of now, there are eight investigations into 17 separate uh, United States Capitol Police officers uh, by the uh, department's Office of Professional Responsibility, which is essentially internal affairs. Um, and there is also a wide ranging in inspector general inquiry into the department's actions on January 6th. Uh, Nicole, we saw some uh, videos on, on social media uh, in which, you know, we saw a Capitol Police officer taking selfies with members of the riot, um, members with rioters, uh, other uh, videos in which we've seen, um, you know, other kind of questionable actions. Um, can you kind of speak to that? And, and you know, I think we also uh, have talked about um, the fact that, you know, 
a racial bias issue is not unique to the Capitol Police Department as well. And I just want to hear your thoughts on, on, on everything like that. I, th I think it's a good question. And I've, you know, I've been, again, talking to a lot of people this week, but also, you know, talking to some of the Capitol Police. When we see those images on social media, I've been preparing people, and I hope we'll get into this a little bit too, about, you know, what this commission needs to be investigating. You, you have to be prepared that there's going to be an excuse for some of these things, and someone might just take that as fact. Right, so when we see a Capitol Police officer opening the barricade, I've, I've had a lot of people reaching out about that, like, why would they open the barricade? Well, you know, it, that is allowed if you think that if, the, if a, a lot of this stuff is subjective to the point where if you see that there is pressure on a barricade and you think that there is someone is, has the potential to be crushed and there's, a, there's gonna be a loss of life, you can make the decision to open up the barricade. Um, I think even, I the selfie like that keeps coming up I think people should be prepared that that officer may be able to get away with the excuse of he was trying he was trying not to incite the crowd any more than they already were and so even as we talk about those those instances and the many more I think that's why it's so important that this commission is independent but also had looks at everything because what I don't want is a report to just say oops things went bad we promise next time it won't be like this um, because that is the kind of, the, I, I think a lot of that is how we've gotten here now. And I, I want to go back to kind of the, the point that both you and Daniel have made about the leadership. You know, Black staffers, Black members of Congress, just people of color in general, have also had instances with the Capitol Police where it, some of this stuff is, because I keep having the same conversation over, like, people are not shocked that some of those things happen. You know, I think about when um, when President Trump was making all of these disparaging remarks and really encouraging people to go and attack and confront Congresswoman Maxine Waters, we went to Capitol Police and we, we said, like, at what point does this Congresswoman get a security detail? At what point does this woman get protection when you have the President of the United States saying she's a problem? People should, people should go take care of, of Maxine. And it's like, oh, well, you know, we've decided a long time ago that there are only certain people who are going to get the, the extra protection of Capitol Police. And it's like, well, so to me, that is not you're going where the threat is. Like, which is what all of our, that's, that's how protection works. Like you go where, where, where someone needs the protection or ideally that's how it's supposed to work. And so, what happened on Wednesday for people who have seen those kind of things over the years, because I use this as an example, I'm like, you know, yes, there are great uh, Capitol Police officers and most of my interactions with them have always been good. But I also, you know, I've walked those halls and I always find it interesting how sometimes I don't have my ID on me or other staffers of color, we don't have our IDs on us. And so we have to stop and show our ID, but our white counterparts walk past us. Um, you know, it's this this concept of the things that happen, the, the racial bias um, the, or the implicit bias that can happen in any other police force. We shouldn't think that just because the Capitol Police are protected members of Congress that there's some kind of veil or there's some kind of protection from them having some of these same issues. So I think in terms of getting back to your question, all of that stuff is going to have to be addressed in this investigation because any kind of report that looks, any kind of report that is, yes, we are recognizing what happened and we are making recommendations and only looking at that at a very surface level, that does not get into the culture, which we can talk about the, the recruitment issues, like also the culture of within Capitol Police, like um, for a lot of officers of color, there is no, the only way that you can grow is to leave the organization. And so when you have that glass ceiling and the leadership is going and the leadership is not, uh, it, it, the leadership is not, there are no minorities in the leadership and they're not focused on increasing minority in leadership. Why would, why would good officers stay? And why, why would you not become complacent? And I, we've seen that in other workforces and we know that that's an issue. And, you know, people don't necessarily want to have a conversation about morale in the Capitol Police, but all of that stuff matters. That is, that is the difference between you going the extra step and saying something here looks strange, let me figure this out, 
versus being like, you know what, that's not my job. That's not my problem. I'm not even, I'm not even concerned with it. Yeah, Daniel, you, you said you had a point. Yeah, so just one thing that I want to add. Um, why were members of Congress giving tours during a pandemic when the Capitol complex is closed? There is a culture around members. Uh, we're seeing this, you know, they don't go through metal detectors. We see a handful of members refusing to go through metal detectors, not going to the House floor where you've not been allowed to bring a firearm for the last 60 something years. And for good reason, um, there uh, is, is sort of like disparate treatment. Like you've got members, you've got congressional staff, then you've got like support staff, and then you have like custodial staff and like other folks at the bottom, right? And there's a pyramid. And that is part of the cultural problem where some people can do what they want. You breeze by and you bring 30 people with you and none of them have to go through security. Really, does that make sense? Does it make sense for people to have firearms in their offices? Like, is, is this the type? But, but no one's well, you know, it's very difficult to say anything about it. And you have the even weirder sort of joint structure overseeing the Capitol Police where the House and the Senate have to agree, uh, which makes these types of changes even harder. So there is a member problem that over, you know, in a, in a, in a, um, I, I can't get the right word, like an unaccountability problem with that, that also permeates then the way the police force uh, interacts and the way the other services interact as well. Yeah, can I jump in and just say to, to, to Chris's point, or sorry, to Daniel's point, the hierarchy that exists of how the, how the laws and how the rules are gonna be upheld is, is to the point of complete ridiculousness. Like this idea of, and I and we've heard from members or we've heard from officers this week that say they actually do believe that there are members of Congress that have their guns on on the campus. Like they there's within the rumor mill, like some offices, like you know who those members are. And so even this pushback that you've seen from members going through a metal detector, it's coming from people that we actually don't think have guns. And and they they're not running commercial saying they're gonna have their gun with them at every point. But I keep reminding people, I'm like, you know, the, the mayor may get final say on the police commissioner, but the mayor still has to follow the law. And until we recognize that that same model has to exist in Congress, like the leadership can make decisions about who is in charge of the Capitol Police, but they do not get to, members of Congress do not get to be outside of the laws that they are enforcing for everyone. And to the point that, that Daniel just highlighted, it's like, you know, there shouldn't even been an opportunity to give tours of the Capitol. If Wednesday never even happens, we're in a pandemic. Like at some point, we, in order to protect everyone, we're going to have to hold these members accountable and they're going to have to follow the same rules and the same laws. Yeah, and there, there were some questions about the state of play with leadership and, and the, the relevant investigations uh, that, um, you know, have, have arisen uh, since January 6th. Uh, so where we're at, Chief Sun resigned on, um, on Friday, last Friday. Acting Chief uh, is Yogananda Pittman, and then uh, Assistant Chief is uh, Chad Thomas. Uh, Gus uh, Papathanasio, the head of the Capitol Police Union, uh, called on uh, a, a Acting Chief, now Acting Chief Pittman's resignation and Assistant Chief Thomas's resignation. They were both the uh, two assistant chiefs at the time of the insurrection and part of the, you know, obviously uh, leaders in the planning process. Tim Ryan uh, agreed with that, that call and supported uh, Gus's call for them to resign. So there's more to come on that and leadership changes after um, the congressional community gets through uh, the inauguration of, of President-elect Joe Biden. And, uh, and then uh, an additional question that I, that I saw that was, uh, that was raised uh, by, by the questions that are coming in uh, is that, you know, questions about, hey, are these Office of Professional Responsibility uh, investigations into these Capitol Police officers and, these IG, and this IG inquiry into the department's actions on January 6th, is the public going to have access to it? And for a long time, uh, there was not a real interest among uh, congressional oversight, um, you know, lawmakers on congressional over the relevant congressional oversight committees to really focus on the, on the Capitol Police because it was, you know, kind of on the back burner. 
now that it's been thrust into the spotlight with the tragic events of January 6th, I think it's reasonable to say, and what I've heard from lawmakers is that, you know, there will be updates on, on these, on these, um, on these reports and these, on, in these investigations. Uh, we also have a uh, house administration committee chairperson, Zoe Lofgren, you know, announced that, you know, she would uh, be, which has oversight of the Capitol police announced that she would be undertaking a bicameral bipartisan uh, investigation into, uh, into what happened, Senate rules and, um, and Homeland Security announced a joint investigation too. So we're seeing much more focus than we've ever seen on the Capitol Police. And I think that is something that will be advantageous for the public when it comes to uh, disclosure. Um, and so, I would like, Chris, yeah, can go, I go make ahead, a, yeah. jump in and make a point about the public? And I, I really, I, it's probably not the people who have tuned into this, but I, one of the things that I would say with this fear of disclosing and really we should be at a place of over disclosing for the public is it also is going to make for better policy changes like putting putting on my like advocacy hat with this i always tell people and uh, when they're like oh gosh you you worked at homeland security for 10 years and and you were i was like i was saving the homeland one word document at a time like I was not out there collecting intel. I have never actually responded to any type of terrorism event with a, a, like I don't have a law enforcement background. I depended on the people that have been on the scene as something was happening. The people who are responding to a, a mass shooting and things like that, I needed their information so that I could write the policy. And we have to understand if you don't let the public, if you don't let the public be a part of the policymaking process, you're going to end up with narrow, unfocused, and unresponsive policy. And we know that, and we see that in every other policy area. And so this idea, I get very passionate about this. Um, this idea that we're not going to let the public and advocates be a part of the policymaking because it's Capitol Police is really gonna set us up for disaster. Like it, it cannot be informed in the way that it needs to be informed without public knowledge. And then also that accountability piece. Yeah, and uh, back in uh, September, uh, you know, uh, I, I wrote for CQ Roll Call, um, in a, you know, an investigation that, that I undertook in which, uh, you know, we found that uh, there was a pattern of misconduct among male Capitol Police officers that was met with light punishment from leadership. Many of those investigations were Office of Professional Responsibility investigations. So they do not have a great track record of holding their own um, officers accountable. Daniel, do you wanna to speak to OPR a little bit? I, I do. So OPR is required on an annual basis to generate a report on misconduct. Um, the report is actually very hard to find because it's not published online. So you have to request it and wait three months to get it. It's about this big and it's just like a little table. And we go every year and we take the, we requested all the data that exists and we, just like we do with the Capitol Police arrest information, we went and we retyped all of it and we turned it into a database and then we tried to see if we could make any sense out of it. Um, people don't, one of the data items in the OPR um, is complaints by the public. How many people know where to go? How many people know the email address to communicate to you? No one does. You can't find it on the Capitol Police's website. It's almost impossible. It's not something that's routinely communicated. And then what happens with any complaint that you would file? Now, I have an amazing team. So I work with Amelia Strauss and Taylor Swift. Those are my colleagues at Demand Progress. We're the ones who have, and I say we, it's largely them who've retyped this data, who've gone back and tried to like make sense out of this who've read all the information, we've dug into the reports to try to find their jurisdiction and all this other stuff. It's really hard and it takes a very long time. And what concerns me is that there will be normal turnover. Ledge branch approach staffers will turn over, House admin and Senate rules will turn over. Uh, Chris, you've done a great job of covering this. Um, there was a report by WAMU, but in the last three years, we couldn't get anybody else uh, who was interested in talking about this. And what will happen is people will move on to the Biden agenda or to the crisis du jour. And without having civil society empowered to help support congressional offices who have been underfunded in part because their funding has not gone to themselves, but rather to go and add to some of the bloat at the Capitol Police. If there isn't the civil society component, if there isn't the journalistic component, 
what's going to happen is they'll make a couple cosmetic changes, they'll fire some people at the top, and they're going to move on. And that is not something that we can let happen. My advice to anyone out there who's looking at this, who has any type of power, is you need to make a whole lot of changes now around the IG, around FOIA, around a civilian oversight board, around the reporting structure, uh, and so on and so forth, and put those in place immediately while also pursuing the parallel track of deeply investigating what's going on, drawing from a wide range of people who are involved in this process, who have expert knowledge around the way things operate, and to have a shorter reporting time, because if you wait, other circumstances will come up, the political imperatives to whitewash, literally whitewash things away, uh, will, will simply grow. And we can't let this happen again. Uh, and OPR is one of those places. One, one point I want to make uh, about the lack of dis disclosure that both Nicole and Daniel have, have touched on is um, the arrest data. And Demand Progress, Amelia from uh, Demand Progress has done good, very good work on compiling a, a, a large uh, you know, report on uh, arrest data um, uh, compiled by the Capitol Police. And it's, it's hard to find their arrest data. It's, it's, they, they, they put out uh, weekly arrest reports uh, and they only started doing this in December of 2018. And if you look at their website right now, you'll notice that the only arrest reports that are able to be looked at right now are the ones from 2020 and uh, the ones from you know 2021. So they've pulled down 2018, they've pulled down 2019, and there's no real way to, uh, unless you're doing what Amelia is doing, which is tracking by hand in an Excel spreadsheet, each individual arrest. And one of the uh, reforms that was proposed in the House bill last summer was to put into place uh, a user-friendly arrest data um, you know, search engine. Um, I, Nicole, Daniel, if either one of you want to jump in, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, so <laughs> go ahead, Nicole. I was going to jump in because, Chris, I know we talked about that you um, did a lot of reporting on police departments in Mississippi. And so I know you know this, like, you know, we read those arrest reports. Uh, maybe this is something only rural people do, but it's, it's, it's entertainment, but it's also information. And it is, it is when you see that your neighbor's house got broken into and someone came in through the window and you're like, you know what, my window was shattered and I thought it was something else, but maybe it was that. The thing about once we start publicly reporting, that's also how we, we encourage more public report, reporting because you know that it's not something that just happened to you. It is something that is ongoing. And to Daniel's earlier point, you also get to start seeing patterns. Um, and so Daniel's about to say something very technical about why we need reporting, but I just wanted to do a very rules aside of how important it is. Yeah, the one thing that I would just add, because um, I think Nicole's point is, is right, is that one, we don't know if their public reporting is complete in terms of the arrests that, they're, that the Capitol Police are doing, because when we asked them about it after we pushed them a while, they said, well, blah, 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 exception, they wouldn't explain it. So we don't actually think that the arrest information is complete. And they often will pass that off arrest to other folks. So like the DC police or the FBI or whoever. So we don't actually have a full picture of what's happening. And we don't know how many of these arrests actually go to prosecution, right? There isn't any, you know, if they arrest 60 protesters, what happens to them? Is it something or is it nothing? If there is a person, there was the incident last year where uh, someone was doxing members of Congress and they didn't make the arrest. I think the FBI made the arrest. Anyway, there, there's a lot of missing pieces about what's going on here and there's no really good way to see it right now. And that's, you know, I'm hoping that we'll have more visibility into the Capitol Police so that we can help them do a better job of helping our democracy continue in the Capitol complex by letting the public in while also keeping them safe. And, uh, you know, we're coming up on, on time. Uh, Nicole, um, I, I want to go to Nicole first, then uh, Daniel, you can jump in after. Um, what, would, what would you like to see um, in terms of reforms going forward that you think would be most advantageous for the public and the congressional community? I think we can look at, I don't have a, a single reform, but I, I would encourage us not to reinvent the wheel here. Like the thing is, we know what, what some of the major police departments, the kind of reform that they have had to undergo, that they are still undergoing. 
And I would encourage us to, when we talk about the Capitol Police, to like suspend political, uh, suspend whatever our political wants and beliefs are about Capitol Police and just focus at a very logistical level of this is a police department. If this is, if this is required for NYPD, if this is required for Chicago PD, there's no reason it shouldn't be required from, for Capitol Police and use those models and put those, put those things that we've seen in place. That is having a, a, a citizen advisory board. But also when we talk about this commission, it's like, you know, we've been very clear that to the point that both you, Chris and Daniel have raised, you can't always, the call can't always come from inside the house. Like you, the idea with police departments, so much of this stuff is institutionalized, so much of it is culture. You really have to have independent people come in and do these sorts of investigations. And so I think as long as we keep the focus that yes, it is Capitol Police, their jurisdiction is different, the, the, the people that they protect and serve are different, but they are still a police department and we should hold them to the same standards as we, we do some of these others. Daniel, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I think the final thing that I would say here um, is that Congress is the people's house, right? The Capitol Police should be a model for other police departments. They shouldn't be a lagging indicator, which is what they've largely been. They have the resources, they have the mission um, we know what works in other places or where we need to be going. They need to be, they need to embody it. So to get us there, we need, you know, there's a long list of recommendations that we made before around transparency and accountability that should be put in place immediately. And there should be, uh, an ongoing process, uh, both the commission, um, that will report out at some point, but also something that is beyond that. Um, so that you have a regular opportunity to continue to engage in reform. It shouldn't just be one change and done, this is gonna to have to be a process for as long as Congress exists. And we need to make sure that those systems are in place um, to, to do that. And I'm, I'm getting some public questions. Uh, could a member of Congress ask to have arrest records deleted or not published? Could they, um, I don't know. I mean, certainly they could ask. Uh, so so I, I've seen other things. So. There was an instance with Andy Harris, uh, representative from Maryland, where he had complained about pro pot protesters assaulting him. And when you see the video, it looks like he actually closed the door on them and not vice versa. So, you know, I don't necessarily trust the accuracy of what's in those police records regarding what happened. Um, so now I've got a truck outside my house, I apologize. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know the answer to that question about deleting stuff. I think what would probably happen more likely uh, is that they would say that it's related to security and that disclosure of the information in some fashion would undermine congressional security, uh, which is probably the basis on which they are already likely redacting information. So I think that there is already information withheld. Um, whether a member of Congress themselves could hold something just because it was political. Oh, actually, there were arrest records that we found uh, from a couple of years ago um, that were that we think are politically sensitive, and we requested that information from the Capitol Police, and then they lost the records, they couldn't find it, and then it hadn't been written up, and we requested it multiple times, and we never got it. So it would not be surprising to me if certain things uh, go in the memory hole. And that if it's politically sensitive to certain folks that it disappears because we have things that we suspect where that has happened, where we have not been able to get an answer, where we think that they're playing games. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it would not be uh, entirely surprising to me if that were to occur. Well, I, I want to thank uh, our street along with our uh, distinguished uh, panelists, Daniel and Nicole for their uh, expert insight on this. I, uh, you know, I learned a lot and uh, I hope um, everyone listening did too as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody.